Hi, let's talk about the blood vessels. In this video, I'll give you a comprehensive introduction to the blood vessels, the types, their structures, their functions, some of their clinical and pathological correlates, and relate them to the main circulatory routes in humans. So when I say blood vessels, I use this interchangeably with the word vasculature. And this can include arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins, sinuses, etc. With respect to terminology, I think that it's critical that um, we specify that arteries are vessels that conduct blood away from the heart. So typically, we think of arteries as conducting oxygenated blood. So we can see here's the aorta leaving from the left ventricle. But um, there's also the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries, which are conducting some of the least oxygenated blood in the body away from the heart. Uh, so uh, that, that idea that arteries conduct oxygenated blood uh, only applies to the systemic loop, which we'll discuss. There are different types of arteries and they become progressively smaller. And so arteries are going to feed into arterioles. Arterioles feed into small vessels called capillary beds, which are permeable. And this is the site of exchange of materials between the cardiovascular system and the interstitial fluid, which surrounds metabolically active tissues. Blood then continues into venules toward the heart, which coalesce into veins that eventually feed either through the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava back into the right atrium. Now, you also may hear over the course of these videos, um, anastomoses. An anastomosis is a connection amongst two or more vessels. Anastomoses are often good because they allow for collateral blood flow. Um, so if there is an issue with one vessel, another vessel can bear the brunt of return or uh, supply uh, from or to a tissue. There are special types of anastomoses called open anastomoses. An open anastomosis is when you can see the connection between vessels with the naked eye. Oftentimes, uh, anastomoses are not open, and they might just, vessels may just share capillary beds, which is a form of blood exchange, but sometimes the vessels actually physically connect in a way that you can see it, and that's an open anastomosis. There is a process of blood vessel development called angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the formation of new vessels. There are, there are very few um, tissues that are more than a, a few millimeters away from capillary beds, um, and new vessels are formed all the time. The amount of capillary beds and vessels that surround tissues are typically proportional to the metabolic needs of those tissues. So more active tissues tend to have more dense beds of vasculature. Now, this is going to be true for both typical and healthy tissues, as well as diseased and pathological tissues. Uh, so for instance, um, neoplastic diseases uh, such as cancers will oftentimes uh, employ uh, angiogenesis and they can increase their rates of mitosis such that there's a higher rate of cell growth. And this is bad. Um, likewise, your skeletal muscles, when they're more active, they can develop more rich capillary beds so that they can more efficiently deliver oxygen and other nutrients to them, which is good. So we'll see that um, arteries and veins and all the vessels in between have differences in their microanatomy that can relate to how they are seen uh, macroscopically. 
The best way to organize our thinking regarding these vessels is to think of the vessels as having three layers or tunics. There is a tunica externa, a tunica media, and a tunica interna. The tunica externa of arteries and veins is very rich in elastin, which is an elastic protein, and collagen, which is a rough and tumble protein. Here we can see that tunica externa on this particular artery. We can also see as deep to this tunica externa, a tunica media, and that tunica media is going to consist of two important layers. There is an external elastic lamina, as we can see here, this, this white Swiss cheese looking structure. That external elastic lamina provides a tremendous amount of elasticity to the vessel, so that as blood pressure increases within the wall, the wall can then push back on that to provide some resistance and forward flow through the vessel. There's also quite a healthy amount of smooth muscle, and this is variable throughout different types of, of arteries. This smooth muscle provides vascular tone to the artery. So um, the artery can change the diameter of its lumen accordingly. Deep to that is the tunica interna. The outermost layer has another elastic lamina, which provides elasticity. Um, and then deep to that is a layer of endothelium, so simple squamous epithelium upon a basement membrane that separates that epithelium from the internal elastic lamina. So various layers here. You know, we've got a supportive and protective layer, an elastic and muscular layer for control, and then an inner layer for the, the proper maintenance of blood flow. There are two major types of arteries, uh, elastic, aka conducting arteries, and muscular, aka distributing arteries. The elastic arteries are some of the largest in the body. So when we think of this, we're thinking of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk and arteries. These are very large, yet at the same time, their lumens are also very large. So when we look at the walls of these arteries, the muscular layers of the tunica media isn't particularly thick. It's the elastic laminae which are thick. So generally the walls of these arteries are about 10% of the total vessel diameter. And what's most important are those well-defined elastic laminae, which provides these vessels the ability to expand and then contract, and that contraction helps to propel blood forward. And that process allows them to serve as pressure reservoirs. So they're able to um, absorb the potential energy of the pressure as an expansion and then convert that back to kinetic energy, pushing the blood forward. The other major type of artery are muscular or distributing arteries. Muscular arteries, as their name suggests, have very, very thick muscular portions to their tunica media. So this can be an upwards of 40 or more layers. So this, even though these arteries are smaller than the elastic arteries, they're much better able to uh, control through means of the autonomic nervous system, the, uh, the overall uh, diameter of their lumen. Now those walls are in total about a quarter of the vessel diameter as opposed to one tenth in the elastic arteries. And so here we can see this is 
less about pressure in terms of control and more about tone or the amount of tension being placed on the smooth muscle within the tunica media by the autonomic nervous system. Speaking of tone, the muscular arteries are going to feed into arterioles, which are best known as resistance vessels because they have they are thinner in, in overall size, but their tunica media, the, the muscular layers, are a greater proportion of the vessel wall, you know, up to about half of the vessel's diameter is accounted for by the wall. And most of this is the smooth muscle. That smooth muscle of the arterioles is controlled by the same autonomic nervous system that the muscular artery smooth muscle is under the control of. And it's important to understand, and you probably hear this through Dr. Sullivan's videos, that the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system its stimulus upon that smooth muscle leads to vasoconstriction. And so vasoconstriction, if this were the lumen of an artery with a sympathetic response, that lumen is going to get smaller. And through getting smaller, as you might think, well, there's, there's less, you know, blood that's traveling through there. And that's, that's true. But uh, that that decrease in size is going to increase the speed in which blood flows through those vessels. Um, arterioles feed into capillary beds. Now, I, I'm not a fan exactly of having the tag of the met arterial where it is. I, I think that it should be higher, and these are somewhat uh, debatable um, in, in terms of their their presence, but what happens is arterial blood will flow into capillary beds. Whether they go through met arterials or not, that's that's somewhat controversial. And then th going through these capillary beds, there are a series of precapillary sphincters. So this is smooth muscle, again, under autonomic control. If these sphincters are relaxed, then blood is free to flow through the capillary beds. And we have exchange of materials, oxygen, nutrients, carbon dioxide, metabolic waste products, biological active substances that then are going to return to this thoroughfare channel into the venule. And from the venule, they'll travel back to veins and through the heart, through to the heart. Um, if these precapillary sphincters are shut tight, then the blood just flows through the thoroughfare channel. It, it doesn't supply the capillary beds with much blood. Some will go through for exchange, but not as much as if those capillaries were um, open. Capillaries themselves are interesting vessels. Um, we categorize them as exchange vessels because they're very permeable and they allow for the movement of material in and out. And there are various types of capillaries. But in, in simplest terms, a, a capillary is just a tunica interna. So we have the endothelium supported by the basement membrane. The overall lumen here has a diameter of about 5 to 10 micrometers, which is significant because the average erythrocyte is about 8 to 10 micrometers in diameter. And that means these erythrocytes will have a tight squeeze or they'll be going through capillaries single file. And this is going to really promote the ability of uh, the hemoglobin within the erythrocytes to exchange oxygen and other gases. Veins are a somewhat more simplified version of arteries. The tunica externa has elastin and collagen. These still are elastic vessels, so they can stretch. Um, they're, they're much 
less um, uh, patent within the, the vessel itself. So uh, arteries have a certain amount of patency within their lumen. Uh, veins tend to collapse more on themselves unless there's there's blood within them. And this is something that you would you would notice in the in the course of dissection. The tunica media has a some smooth muscle. It's definitely not as thick as arteries. The real interesting part of many veins, not all, but many, is the tunica interna. It still has the endothelial layer supported by the basement membrane, but in some veins there are these interesting elaborations of the tunica interna which form valves. And these are one-way valves because as blood moves from one section to the other, if it attempts to flow back, the valves close. This can be very handy because blood flow in veins is very low pressure and relies on forces other than blood hydrostatic pressure is generated by the heart in order to move things forward. So venules coalesce towards veins um, and we can see here that uh, this blood flow, when the valves are open, is one direction, or it ought to be unidirectional. But so, so if blood were to flow back, these valves close, and blood is prevented from retrograde flow. There are three types of uh, forces that can aid in this forward motion of blood. One is demonstrated here, and that is muscle milking. So veins that are adjacent to skeletal muscles, as the skeletal muscles contract and then relax, the forces from those contractions and relaxations squeeze the venous blood from chamber to chamber. There's also respiratory milking, so as the diaphragm depresses and then relaxes, that changes the volume of surrounding um, cavities, such as the thoracic cavity, the abdominal pelvic cavity, which can put pressure on major veins. And that's respiratory milking. And then another strategy, this is pretty brilliant, is that of uh, veni comitantes, singular vena comitans. Veni comitantes are accompanying veins, and usually these veins will be tightly bound to their accompanying arteries, and the pulsatile nature of the arteries puts pressure on the veins to help return the blood. So we have blood and arteries moving one direction, and blood in the accompanying veins moving the exact opposite direction. From time to time, these valves in veins can fail. So here is a healthy typical valve. And here is an example of uh, valvular incompetence where the leaflets fail to approximate and blood can retrograde flow in reverse. When this happens, the veins become dilated or varicose and these varicosities can sometimes be seen in the uh, the superficial veins of of the limbs um, oftentimes these are just uh, for some folks a, a cosmetic concern and they rarely pose any sort of uh, clinical threat what can be a uh, a life-threatening condition would be a venous thrombo embolism. So V-T-E. So a thrombus is a clot. So thrombosis is a form of vascular clot. Platelets uh, can coagulate within vessels, um, especially in veins where the, uh, the level of, of pressure and in, in movement is, is low and slow. Now that vascular clot can move and when it lodges in a place, we refer to it as an embolism. And depending on where that embolism lodges 
um, it could be life-threatening. So let's let's start with the uh, the the pathology cycle. So um, a deep vein thrombosis or a DVT typically happens in one of the deep veins of the lower limb. So we're talking leg or thigh. Um, in times when there isn't a lot of movement, if you think of an individual who might be sitting for a long period of time, maybe they're on a transatlantic or transpacific flight where they're just in their seat for 8 to 12 hours. There's not a lot of movement there. And so blood can begin to pool in the lower limbs. There's something called Virchow's triad, which is uh, a series of three conditions that can increase the risk of a deep vein thrombosis. The first is stasis or a lack of movement. With stasis, there's little muscular milking, so there's much less return of this blood flow. An individual may also have some sort of hypercoagulopathy um, or uh, thrombophilia, and this, these are states in which blood is more likely to clot. And if there's any sort of endothelial injury to the, the lining of these veins, uh, these blood clots are much more likely to occur and form. So with these three conditions of Virchow's triad, a thrombosis, a deep vein thrombosis can form. That deep vein thrombosis can follow the venous system up into the inferior vena cava, which then feeds into the right atrium of the heart, which then goes into the right ventricle of the heart, which then goes through the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries. And it's possible for that thrombus to then become a pulmonary embolism, a PE. And with the case of a pulmonary embolism, this blockage of a pulmonary artery or a branch of a pulmonary artery can absolutely be life-threatening. So it's, it's vital that uh, an individual with a deep vein thrombosis, and here we can see a little bit of edema from a deep vein thrombosis having formed, um, to be evaluated uh, immediately. This is an emergent situation. Now I'd like to talk a little more specifically um, about veins or continue a specific venous discussion. There are um, two specifically venous systems um, that we like to discuss in the context of both systems-based anatomy and gross anatomy. The, the first being the, the caval system, which is pretty straightforward. The caval system is any blood from the systemic loop which is being returned to the right atrium through either the superior or inferior vena cava. Then there are portal systems. Portal systems are vessels that connect one set of capillary beds with another set of capillary beds. And the major portal system that gets discussed, whether it's systems-based anatomy or gross anatomy, is the hepatic portal system. With the hepatic portal system, capillary beds within the wall of the gastrointestinal tract from the esophageal, the abdominal part of the esophagus through to the rectum all coalesce, and so they're, they're picked up so by veins, all coalesce into major visceral venous portions, and they meet together to form the portal vein, which then delivers this blood to the liver for processing. So that is the totality of the hepatic portal system. That blood then from the liver gets picked up by other capillaries and pushed into hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava. So that blood is destined for the caval system. There's also a 
hypophyseal portal system, which is another venous portal system connecting capillary beds in the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. So a lot of those hypothalamic um, hormones can move between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. There's also a renal portal system where um, specialized capillary beds within the kidney, so of the nephron, specifically the glomeruli, connect to paratubular capillaries of the nephron. And so there are many of these in each kidney. So as many nephrons as there are for within the kidney, there are that many renal portal systems. And this is interesting because this is an example of an arterial portal system, whereas the other two are venous portal systems. Now I'd like to set the stage for many of the other videos that uh, that you'll listen to in this playlist, um, that there is a fundamental difference between the systemic circulatory route and the pulmonary loop. The systemic loop is running from the left ventricle of the heart out to metabolically active tissues back to the right atrium of the heart. And there are very many different subtypes of circulatory roots here, and they're all generally regional. So there's coronary circulation uh, for the heart, cerebral circulation for the, uh, the brain or the cerebrum, um, you know, there's upper limb, lower limb, thoracic, abdominal, etc. There's also portal systems within that systemic loop. And then there's the pulmonary loop. The pulmonary loop starts at the right ventricle, goes out to the lungs, and then returns to the left atrium. The pulmonary loop is all about gas exchange in the lungs. All right, that leads us to our question. And that question is, at which level of vessel does the autonomic nervous system have the greatest control over blood flow? A, elastic arteries, B, muscular arteries, C, arterioles, D, venules, E, veins. Well, you should know that if there is smooth muscle, the autonomic nervous system is going to have some level of control, but the greatest level of control will be the arterioles. And that's why we refer to the arterioles as resistance vessels. Thank you very much for your time.